Hello everybody, this is Andrew Wolf here. In this video I'm going to talk about the physiology of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, otherwise known as the RAAS. Now, um, I just wanted to say here, this is the first video that I'm making with a white background rather than a black background because I've received the feedback that it is easier to view um, a white videos with a white background on uh, portable devices like phones and such. So I'm interested in hearing your feedback if you think that this video is easier to see the images um, or if you have a preference one way or the other. Uh, please leave it in the comments below and just let me know what you think. Okay, so back to the material. So the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Really to understand the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, we need to talk, go back to our um, anatomy of the nephron. So here we have in the nephron, we have the afferent arterial um, bringing blood into the glomerulus, and we have the efferent arterial bringing, bringing blood away from the glomerulus, and then we have here, in, uh, we have Bowman's capsule that is making filtrate of urine, and we go through the proximal convoluted tubule and down into the loop of Henle, and then we go into the distal convoluted tubule. Yeah, I didn't make it look very convoluted here. And then what's important to understand, and I haven't really made this clear in some of my other videos, but the distal convoluted um, tubule, this is uh, the nephron, you know, when we draw the mod model of the nephron, we kind of stretch it out a little bit, but the nephron is actually very sort of close together, and the distal convoluted tubule actually sort of curves back around and, and ends up um, sort of coming into contact with the afferent and efferent arterioles uh, before heading out to the collecting duct. Now, the, this allows for the formation of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So again, this is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And this is essentially where the distal convoluted tubule comes in contact with the afferent arteriole. And it's made up of two different groups of cells. One group of cells is specially adapted tubular epithelial cells that line the surface of the tubule just adjacent to the afferent arteriole. So these cells here are called, these specially adapted cells are called the macula densa. So these are epithelial cells in the distal convoluted tubule where the distal convoluted tubule comes up against the afferent arteriole. And these macula densa, densa cells are sensitive to changes in sodium and chloride concentration. And in response to changes in this concentration, the um, max, macula densa communicates with juxtaglomerular cells. So what are these cells? Well, juxtaglomerular cells are actually um, cells that are surrounding the afferent arteriole. And interestingly enough, these juxtaglomerular cells are actually specially adapted smooth muscle cells. So just like other smooth muscle cells of the arteriole, um, they are, lie just outside the basement membrane of the arteriole. Juxta glomerular cells. So these are specially adapted smooth muscle cells. And these smooth muscle cells can no longer contract. They don't have any actin and myosin, but they are sensitive to stretch. So what causes these cells to stretch? Well, changes in pressure or flow inside the arteriole. So 
So if we have increased pressure or flow, then this will be sensed by these juxtaglomerular cells. Now these juxtaglomerular cells are also unusual because they can synthesize and secrete renin. Okay, so this brings us back to our discussion of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So let's talk in general about the things that can cause the release of renin. Well, renin secretion is caused by stimulation of the juxtaglomerular cells. So what can stimulate the juxtaglomerular cells? Well, first of all, stim the juxtaglomerular cells can be stimulated by the macula densa. And this is caused by changes to sodium chloride concentrations in the distal tubule. Now, the second thing is caused by direct stimulation due to stretch of the juxtaglomerular cells. And actually what stimulates it is decreased stretch. Now, both of these things are caused by decreased flow to the kidneys and this will cause decreased stretch and decreased glomerular filtrate production which causes the changes to the sodium chloride concentration of the distal tubule. Now, the third thing that can stimulate juxtaglomerular cells to stimulate, uh, to secrete renin is activation of beta-1 adrenergic receptors on the surface of the GAG cells, of the juxtaglomerular cells. What stimulates beta adrenergic receptors? Well, just like anywhere else in the body, it is stimulated by epinephrine or norepinephrine. Now there are sympathetic nervous system fibers that directly innervate the nephron so this may be um, from the nervous system or this may be from adrenals so it could either be the hormone or the neurotransmitter uh, secretion of epi and norepinephrine. Okay, so those are the three um, causes. Decrease flow, which causes decreased stretch, and decreased glomerular filtrate, which causes changes to the um, sodium chloride concentration in the distal tubule, or stimulation by the adrenergic nervous system. Okay, so now we have the juxtaglomerular cells that are secreting renin. So what happens then? Okay, so we have JG cells secreting renin. What does renin do? Well, the liver is constantly making a substance called angiotens angiotensinogen. Now, this is similar to other proteins that are made in the liver. This just floats into, in the plasma stream, in the plasma of the blood, as an inactive protein. And it's just waiting to be activated. Now, just for, for your reference, angiotensinogen is also, I've seen it called, renin substrate. These are synonyms for the exact same thing. And again, it's a protein that's floating around in the bloodstream in an inactive form. What happens is angiotensinogen, when it meets up with the with renin, which is an enzyme, causes the angiotensinogen 
to um, cleave a component of it so it changes conformation and it changes into angiotensin 1. So again, this is just a slight change to the angiotensinogen protein to become angiotensin 1. Now as far as I know, angiotensin 1 does not have any direct actions in the body, but angiotensin 1 goes floating around the plasma and it comes in contact with an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme. And angiotensin converting enzyme, you know, let me make this a, a bolder color here, angiotensin converting enzyme is synthesized by endothelial cells. Now, you know, the theory is that angiotensin converting enzyme is primarily in the lungs, is synthesized and um, comes in contact with angiotensin 1 primarily in the lungs. Now, the theory now is that it's really um, expressed by endothelial cells throughout the body. However, if you think about it, the pulmonary vasculature has the vast majority of endothelial cells in the body just because there is more vasculature in the lungs because it has a much greater, the pulmonary vasculature has a greater surface area than the systemic vasculature by, you know, two or threefold. And so there are more endothelial cells in the pulmonary vasculature, hence there is a greater amount of ACE inhibitor in the pulmonary vasculature than there is in the systemic vasculature. So anyway, anyway, the angiotensin 1 goes floating around the bloodstream, goes through the pulmonary vasculature, comes in contact with, with angiotensin converting enzyme, and gets converted to angiotensin 3. I mean angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 3 comes later. Now angiotensin 2 is an active hormone in its own right and it has several different actions in the body one of which is it directly causes vasoconstriction and it's a rather relatively weak vasoconstrictor but it does cause vasoconstriction and this actively causes an increase in blood pressure All right so again this is a relatively weak effect it is not as strong as, say, direct sympathetic uh, stimulation of, um, of the smooth muscles in arterioles. Now, the other two major effects is to increase the secretion of antidiuretic hormone, which causes a um, increase in water reabsorption in the collecting ducts, and an increase in thirst, so we drink more. So as angiotensin um, travels in the bloodstream, um, it goes through the liver and it gets broken down into angiotensin 3. And it's actually angiotensin 3 is a metabolite of angiotensin 2, and angiotensin 3 then goes on to, to stimulate the secretion of aldosterone in the adrenal cortex. So this is occurring in the adrenal gland. So what does aldosterone do? Well, aldosterone works primarily in the distal tubules of the kidney to increase sodium reabsorption. And it does this by stimulating or increasing the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So remember, sodium in the sodium potassium ATPase pump, sodium is exchanged for potassium. So it causes sodium reabsorption, but it actually causes potassium secretion. This is a good thing to be aware of. So what is the end effect? Well, the water the distal tubules of the kidney are freely permeable to water so when we have sodium reabsorption we also have water reabsorption so this causes increased volume
Okay. Now, aldosterone is also um, doing a couple of other things, and it also causes sodium, increases cause, uh, sodium reabsorption in the gut as well, through the same mechanism, interestingly enough. So, and again, water follows, and we have an increase in blood volume. So, when a, when renin is secreted from the juxtaglomerular cells through all of these effects through the increase in blood volume because of aldosterone's effect and the increased thirst and the increased activity of antidiuretic hormone we end up with the major effect is a sustained increase in blood volume and this causes a sustained increase in blood pressure. And then we also have the weak um, input of the sort of minor vasoconstriction that's occurring because of angiotensin 2. Okay, so this ends my discussion of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone renin system and the juxtaglomerular apparatus. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, leave a question in the comments and I'll answer it if I'm able to. And I'm also going to put up my links as I usually do so that you have quick and easy access to my other videos. And I hope to see you in another video soon. Thanks.